whistleblowers, skeptics, all were there listening and hearing the words of Jesus as he preached this powerful message that still resonates today and is still relevant today, 2,000 years later. It reminds us it just wasn't a good man speaking a good word, but it was God in the flesh speaking the eternal word that still has power today to bring about change in our lives. So if we'll hear, we'll listen, receive the word, it will help us, and it will be of great support to us as we journey through this life. So the title of this study tonight is Tell It Like It Is. Tell it like it is. Speak the truth. Amen. Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. So as we read that, this has got a lot of depth in it. It goes really deep in my study on this. It took a lot of a lot of time, a lot of research, getting down into the depth of these scriptures. It's pretty amazing what all comes out of this. And I'll try my best to stay on target, on time tonight as much as possible. But the issue that we see here, the underlying issue of all of this is because of hypocrisy and lying. It is the main point, the main emphasis of this passage. And the first sin that ever happened on the earth was a lie. Satan deceived Adam and Eve, which plunged the world into sin and destruction. From that point, lying became common. Lying is something that has affected everybody. Lying is something uh, that it doesn't have to be taught. It doesn't have to be learned. A little baby, a little child, a little young toddler will lie to you. And you've never taught them how. You've never said anything to them. They've never watched anybody lie. They've never, but it's just something that they will do. They'll, they'll get to school and they'll lie to their teacher. And we're just stunned that our little baby would lie. And it's so devastating when we learn that they lie. And so we have to teach them how to tell the truth. And we have to teach them lessons about the truth. So we see that it's part of our fallen nature that we're born with in that we're born liars. Dishonesty is an epidemic everywhere you go. Children struggle with it. Adults struggle with it. People, they'll lie at work. They will lie at their house. People will lie when they're talking on the telephone. People will lie on the television. They'll lie on the news channel. They'll lie when they get on social media. And they'll lie in their business dealings. And we wonder, why all the lying? Well, there's a few reasons here. I think it's very important to point this out. People like to make themselves look better. Is one reason they lie. You know, a little exaggeration makes a story a little more interesting. Huh? People lie to protect themselves from consequences, often to cover up a mistake or a failure that they've had. And people lie to gain something they want. Good grades, a promotion, or a, a tax benefit. Winston Churchill said it this way. He said that men occasionally stumble over the truth, but 
most of them pick themselves up in a hurry, and they hurry off as if nothing ever happened. People just stumble into it and don't even realize it. And sometimes it's easier for people to uh, tell a lie than it is to tell the truth. So Jesus here in our study tonight is addressing the issue of corruption in speech or careless speech. The issue of not having integrity in one's speech is what he's getting at here tonight. And the issue of lying and not being completely honest is a heaven and hell issue. We talked about that last week when it come to adultery and sexual immorality, that there are things that, that are clearly heaven and hell issues, and not telling the truth is a heaven and hell issue. Truth knows no degrees, it, no gray area. It's, it's only black and white, and half-truths are, are whole lies. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 17 these six things the Lord hates, yes, seven, are an abomination to him, a proud look and a lying tongue. Proverbs twelve twenty two: lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are his delight. And we also know, according to Scripture, that liars will find their place in the lake of fire, Revelation 21 and 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual, immoral, uh, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Sometimes lies can start out very small. Sometimes it seems it's just, you know, the, what we call the little white lies. You know, somebody will call and and your wife answers the phone, and you tell them, tell them I'm not here. Right? So it starts out small, but then once we can lie about something small, we might can lie about something else, and then before long, you've lied about a whole bunch of things because you can justify a small lie, so then it's easier to kind of graduate up to something else. And... So we must understand the seriousness of, of any kind of untruth. And Jesus continues to correct and clarify the misunderstanding and misinterpretations of the commands. He starts out each by saying, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. And we studied that already. But Jesus basically was saying, But you hate and that's murder in your heart. Though they thought because they didn't commit adultery, they, they thought they were all right. He says, you commit it in your heart, and it's just the same. They had thought because they did the paperwork in their divorces, they were all right. But he says, when you divorce for something other than sexual immorality, you make everybody an adulterer. Jesus exposed their sinful hearts and revealed their immorality. Jesus put the commands back into their original context, back where they belonged. And he said, God is concerned with your hearts, not your external religious acts. You are sinners. Your hearts are angry and hateful. Your hearts are lustful. And your adulteries are many through your illegitimate, uh, unbiblical divorces. And now he comes to a fourth illustration here tonight of sinfulness in verse 33, and here he says, You think you have found a loophole, but I'm telling you, you're nothing but deceivers and liars. And we often look for loopholes. We, we look for those ways that we can try to circumvent the truth. And this is one of those passages that we read a lot of times, and it seems obscure, and and difficult to understand, so we kind of skip over it and not really dig down into the meaning of what Jesus is really saying. Uh, and sometimes we skip over Scripture because we, we don't really understand it. But whatever Jesus has to say, we must stop and study it and try to do our very best to understand it more fully. 
And that's what we're trying to do here tonight is really fully understand this passage. As I've been saying, what God wants us to do when it comes to His Word is to, is to love it, to learn it, and live it. That's what He wants us to do with His Word. We certainly should pay attention when the Bible is talking about our speech. For James 3 and 2 says, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Matthew 12, 34, Jesus said, For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Matthew 15, 18, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. So we need to learn that what we say is a vital thing because it is nothing but the thermometer of our heart. The words that come out of our mouth reveal what's in our heart. Whenever the Bible talks about speech or the tongue, making oaths, uh, what we say, uh, we must listen. We must listen to this, what the Scripture is saying. Psalm 15, verse 1 and 2, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who, Lord, may abide in your presence? Who can come into your presence and spend time with you and have a relationship with you? He's asking the question, who may dwell in your holy hill? And the answer is, he who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. Have you ever wondered what would happen if one day, just say tomorrow, for example, if everybody woke up tomorrow, everybody, and told the truth. Well, for one, our government would collapse. Our world would just go into a tailspin. It would just, the whole thing would just come crumbling down. Because our society and our governments are all built on the framework of lies. Daniel Webster said, there is nothing as powerful as truth, and often nothing as strange. Taking an oath was permitted in the Old Testament. And that's the part of this passage that kind of throws us because Jesus says, you know, not to, not to take an oath. But we find that there are oaths taken all through the Bible. So it's not unbiblical to take an oath. Over in Deuteronomy 10, 20, the Scripture says, You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve Him, and to Him you shall hold fast and take oaths in His name. Jeremiah 12, 16 says, And it shall be if they will learn carefully the ways of my people to swear by my name as the Lord lives, as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then they shall be established in the midst of my people. So oaths were made to bring greater accountability between people. Uh, that individuals would feel a greater degree of responsibility to do what they said they would do. And also in Deuteronomy 23, 21 says, When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you. And it would be sin to you. So we need, if we make a vow, if we make a promise, we need to carry through with it. We need to make good on it. If we don't, we become a liar. We have lied. If we tell we're going to do, if we say we're going to do something and we don't do it, we become a liar. So your actions, too, can make you a liar. Just in the fact that you say, I'm going to do this, and you never do it, you have become a liar. So the sin would be, not necessarily the oath here, but the sin would be to break the oath or make one or make an oath that would just be carelessly made, be made in a rash way without much thought, without much care or consideration, uh, without really being serious and, and considering what all is at stake and what all is going to be required. Oaths were only to be made for the most solemn occasions and were to be kept. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 2 says, Do not be rash with your mouth. Mm, that's a whole other lesson, isn't it? 
And let not your heart utter anything hastily before God, for God is in heaven and you're on earth. So in other words, you need to remember your place and who you are and where you're at. Therefore, let your words be few. Ecclesiastes 5, verses 4 through 6. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it. For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Better not to vow than to vow and not to pay. Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin. Nor say before the messenger of God that it was an error. It was a mistake. I really didn't mean what I said. Why should God be angry at your excuse and destroy the work of your hands? This is exactly what the Jews were doing of that day. They were being careless with taking oaths. They they were breaking them and deceiving others by actually using them. They were using oaths as a method of deception and manipulation. D.A. Carson explains it this way. In the Jewish code of that day, of the law, called the Mishnash, There is one whole section given over to the question of oaths, including detailed consideration of when they were binding and when they were not. For example, one rabbi says that if you swear by Jerusalem, you are not bound by your vow. But if you swear toward Jerusalem, then you are bound by your vow. The swearing of oaths uh, thus degenerates into terrible rules which let you know when you can get away with lying and deception, and when you can't. These oaths no longer foster truthfulness, but weaken the cause of truth and promote deceit. Swearing evasively becomes justification for lying. So some of the Jews here we see taught that as long as you didn't use God's name in the oath, you were free to break it. It created a loophole. A way out of the oath if you needed to get out of it. In fact, they use this scripture right here as their, as their proof, Leviticus 19, 12. And you shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. So therefore, they would swear upon anything else. They would swear upon their mother's grave. They would swear upon Jerusalem. They would swear upon heaven. They would swear upon their father or earth. Anything but swear upon God. They would also swear on any occasion for any reason. They would swear on frivolous things that were not considered to be solemn or sacred. Just anything that come along, they would make an oath. And we live in a dishonest culture. I don't have to tell you that. You know that where deceptive practices are looked upon as just the way business gets done. But dishonesty and careless oaths and deception must be rejected and not tolerated, whether it be in personal business or even in corporate business. It can be as simple as this. It starts out like this. Children make promises Uh, But after they make the promise and they decide they don't want to do it, they said, I had my fingers crossed. Thinking that somehow or another that means they no longer have to fulfill the oath or the promise that's been made. Modern lawyers and businessmen know very well how to find and create loopholes because they earn their living pouring over documents, trying to either find a way out of keeping a contract or making the other party keep the contract. They are not concerned about the original intent of the contract. Their interest is the specific language of the fine print that might allow, always read the fine print, that might allow them to manipulate things to their liking. Lawyers can write long and elaborate contracts into which they insert some sort of clause or loophole to make the contract non-binding so that their client does not have to keep their promises. 
Such lawyers are essentially very good at what's called lying legally. Didn't know there was such a term. Legally lying. And this is what the Jewish leaders were doing. They, they had created a system where they could lie and get away with it legally. They just fit their lies into a nice, comfortable category. If you didn't say in the Lord's name, you could lie, and it was okay. They found a way, or so they thought, to circumvent the truth. William Barclay said it this way, Here is a great eternal truth. Life cannot be divided into compartments in some of which... God is involved, and in others of which He is not involved. There cannot be one kind of language in the church and another kind of language in the home. I heard a guy one time who was talking, and he said, uh, you know, it's a word you you shouldn't say in church. I thought, well, it's probably a word you shouldn't say at all, right? Right? Now, if you should if you, if you say it in church, probably shouldn't say it at all. Amen. Amen. That's just like parents say, well, that's really not, you shouldn't let your kids watch it, so stay up late when they're going to bed, you can watch it. Well, I'm pretty sure if my kids don't need to be watching it, I don't need to be watching it either. Can I get an amen here on Wednesday night? <laughs> amen. There cannot be one kind of standard of conduct in the church and then another standard of conduct in the business world. The fact is that God does not need to be invited into certain departments of life and kept out of others. He's everywhere, all through life, in every activity of life. He hears not only the words which are spoken in His name, He hears all words. And there cannot be any such thing as a, as a form of words which evades bringing God into any transaction. We will regard all promises as sacred if we remember that all promises are made in the hearing in the presence of God. We must not compartmentalize our lives and think it's okay to lie over here and yet speak the truth over here. There's no sacred or secular. There is something terribly wrong with telling the truth in church and then lying In your business, you can't separate things into categories. Matthew 23, verses 16 through 22, Jesus addresses this. He says, Woe to you blind guides who say, Whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that sacrifices the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sacrifices the gift? Therefore, who swears by the altar, swears by it, and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple, swears by it, and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven, swears by the throne of God, and by him who sits on it. So when Jesus said... But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, or for it's God's throne, nor by the earth, for it's His footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great King. He was saying, you can't just decide that you can keep this vow over here and then not keep the vow over there. No matter how you phrase it or word it, you must tell the truth and keep the truth. When Jesus said, do not swear at all, was this a prohibition on all oaths? That's the question. The big question here tonight. When he said, do not swear at all, was this prohibiting all oath making? Well, let's go back into Scripture. Let's get into the Old Testament, New Testament. Let's let's rightly divide the Word. We have to rightly divide the Word of God to understand this more correctly. Genesis 22, 16, we find, again, that there is the swearing, the, the making of oaths, because when, when God made the covenant with Abraham, and Abraham was willing to take his son Isaac, 
up on top of the mountain and sacrifice him. We know that the Lord provided a sacrifice. And so Abraham did not have to sacrifice Isaac. And so at that point in Genesis twenty two sixteen, 16, the Lord said to him, By myself I have sworn, the Lord is, is making an oath, he, he swears on himself because there's nobody greater than him, right? You can't, God can't you know, find someone greater to swear to or make an oath to, so he makes it to himself. By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. And we also know, too, that Jesus was under an oath at his trial just before the crucifixion. In Matthew 26, verses 63 through 64, But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest, which was Caiaphas, said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, he spoke, It is as you said, nevertheless I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So Jesus was under oath at his mock trial that they put up to uh, convict him. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 16 in the New Testament, the Scripture says, For men indeed swear by the greater, which is God, an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. So people do make oaths, uh, and they do make agreements with an oath, with a swearing to, to try and settle disputes. And then 2 Corinthians 1.23, we know the Apostle Paul, uh, he had these words to say, Moreover, I call God as witness, someone greater making an oath, as witness against my soul, than to spare you I came no more to Corinth. In Galatians 1 and 20, Paul again says, Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed before God, as my witness, I make an oath, I do not lie. So we see that oath-making continues. It's in the New Testament. And so there is not a, a prohibition on all oath-making. So the proper understanding is that Jesus is saying, Stop swearing like you have been. Stop the swearing like, like you have been going about it. If, if you are swearing and making oaths carelessly for deception and for just any common reason and not making it seriously, don't swear at all. Just stop. You can't swear by heaven and avoid God. That's God's throne. Or by earth, you can't avoid Him there either. That's His footstool. Or by Jerusalem, you can't avoid Him there. That's the city of the great King or, and, you, and you swear by your head, but you can't make one hair white or black unless you use coloring. Just seeing if y'all are still out there awake. Because that, all you do is you just cover up the fact, right? Fact remains, you've just covered it up. And that's what Jesus is saying. The fact remains of your untruth. But you've just covered it up. So Jesus is not removing all oaths. He's saying, swear not at all in this manner that you have been accustomed to, evasively trying to cover your lies, deceive, and find loopholes. The admonition and warning is clear that we, are, that we better keep oaths only for solemn occasions. And I think that's the key point here. To keep oaths for solemn occasions. Verse 37 is where he tells us that. And you better not do it as a way of life just anywhere at any time for any common, ordinary reason. So be very careful. You know, and one of the things that just, uh, uh, you know, again, that, that just kind of sends a, a uh, you know, I guess just shudders me and just really disturbs me is when I hear somebody say, I swear to God. Boy, if I would have said that growing up, my mama, she told me to never swear. Don't you swear? I couldn't even say the word swear. I swear. I was in trouble. Amen. Anybody else? You didn't swear. You didn't, you, you didn't say swear. Now, I'm not talking about swearing in the, in, the, in the way of cussing. I'm talking about just using the word swear. But you hear people all the time, they say, I swear to God. I'm telling the truth. If they got to do that. I really wonder, are they really telling the truth? Because one, what you have done is you have made a careless oath 
And you have taken God's name in vain, all in one phrase. So we must only keep oaths on those special occasions in life, such as wedding vows. That's an oath. It's a sacred moment, solemn moment. We should only make oaths when, when it's needful. At a solemn and sacred occasion, we must never be flippant by saying them in everyday conversation. A good summary of the issue of taking oaths is made by Kent Hughes. He says it this way, Oath-taking is permitted, but is not encouraged. In civil life, oath-taking, as in the courtroom, is permitted, and when one does so, he does not sin against Christ's teaching. Also, on rare occasions, it may be necessary, as it was for Paul. However, oaths are not to be a normal part of our everyday conversation. In normal relations, oaths should never fall from our lips. Kingdom men and women do not need such devices. Their commitment to faithfulness should be evident to all. When invoking God's name is the right thing to do because of the seriousness of the matter, we must do so with the greatest care and with the greatest reverence. But on other occasions, in our normal day-to-day -day speech and dealings, we must let our yes be a yes, and our no be a no. Our words need to be our bond. We need to learn how to look at people and say yes. And people take that as the truth. That you have lived such a way in front of your coworkers, in front of your family, that they know when you say yes, it means yes. There's nothing behind it. There's no, there's no scheming. There's no manipulation. It is yes. And you can count on it. Or when you say no, they know that it means no, and you can count on it. Uh, Proverbs 10 and 19, In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. You know, sometimes you can say too much. You just keep talking and talking and talking and talking. Amen? And my wife, and this hasn't happened in a long time, y'all, but my wife has looked at me before and she just says, quit talking. Just quit talking. Because you can get to the point where you're saying too much, trying to prove your case and convince everybody. And the longer you do that and the harder you try, the more suspicious people become if you're really being truthful. If our conversation is so suspect every day that I have to make vows to God that I'm telling the truth, then there's something wrong in my life. When we open our mouth, the truth are to come out. <laughs> and on those solemn occasions when we vow a vow to God, we are to keep that vow. And on those other occasions in the daily matter of life, our yes should be yes and our no should be no. Anything more than that reveals an evil heart and untrustworthiness. You see, Satan is a liar. How many of you know that? And we find that over in John 8, 44. He is a liar. He is the father of lies. When we practice dishonesty, you know, listen, I'm closing, I'm done. When we practice dishonesty in any way, we not only act like the devil, but we open the door for him to speak through us. I mean, we accept lies and we speak them. We allow Satan to use our voice box to deceive, discourage, and destroy. And we must be aware of this reality. In our daily conversation, let us speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help us God. Amen. Would you stand? And we'll pray and we'll go home. And we'll tell it like it is.